queer. And out of here. If you know anything about roller coasters, theme parks, or just overall places in the US to go to, then chances are you've heard of Cedar Point. This is arguably the flagship amusement park in America and has probably the greatest collection of roller coasters on the planet. Everywhere you look, there's a banger ride from the front of the park to the literal mile walk it is all the way to the back. Oh, you thought Gatekeeper looked cool? Try Raptor. Bam, Wicked Twister. Boom, bam, bop, bada bop, boom. Pow. But there's so much more to this park than just the roller coasters because I really do believe that a trip to Cedar Point is unlike any other. Obviously, the coasters do play a major role, but y you know, it's not the only great thing about this park. About a month ago, I took a trip to Cedar Point for two days and three nights, and it's been really hard to describe my experience in a video format because it really was just an absolutely incredible trip. But in this video, I'm going to try and do my best, so this is the ultimate, ultimate review. review of Cedar Point. Your trip to Cedar Point really starts before you even leave the car. The entry experience to this park is honestly perfect and it makes going to this park feel more like an event than just another amusement park. A lot of people have heard of the iconic Cedar Point Causeway, but even before that you see Cedar Point signs everywhere you look. They're like little teaser trailers and then driving up the causeway is like the Bazooka Super Bowl TV spot. It honestly got my heart racing driving by the Cedar Point Sports Center and the Express Hotel and the countless Cedar Point signs before we finally got on that causeway and saw the park from afar. I don't care where you've been or what you've seen, driving down this causeway and seeing the entire collection of rides laid out in front of you on a platter will give you goosebumps every time. Then as you pull into the parking lot, you'll notice just how massive this park is and how far it stretches back. Remember how I said this park is a mile long? No, like, really, I, w I wasn't joking. This park is actually a mile long. Like, they literally can't even make a sky ride long enough for this. It just stops halfway, and then there's a train for the back of the park. You'll see Gatekeeper flying over the front gate through those keyholes and want nothing more but to get in and get on a ride. And here's the thing. That's not the only way to get in the park. Oh no, there are wow. four different gates to get into the park. There's also the Valraven Gate where you can take a freaking boat to get to. Like imagine rolling up to the roller coaster capital of the world in a goddamn boat. Come on. That's cool. I don't need a well thought out explanation for why I like it. That's just cool. You know that's cool. There's also the Windseeker Gate, which is probably the worst one. This one drops you off by Wicked Twister and Windseeker, and that's about it. There's not a whole lot else there. I guess it's kind of cool to walk along the beach to get there, but like. Meh, it's all right, I guess. So I want to quickly mention that with the removal of Wicked Twister, rest in peace, there is really no use for this gate anymore. I mean, I don't really know how many Wicked Twister fans there were to begin with, but now all you really have is a Windseeker and a couple of Camp Snoopy rides, so... I, mean, I guess go crazy, but I don't know. There's really nothing else here. So the last gate I want to talk about is probably the best gate out of all of them. This gate combines spectacle, functionality, and experience into one to make it the ultimate of all four. The front gate is all about spectacle. It's really cool to walk under gatekeeper's keyholes to get into the park. The Valor Raven gate is all about experience. Taking a boat up to an amusement park just sounds like a wet dream to me, and this looks to do it perfectly. And then there's Wicked Twister's gate. This gate is actually terrible. Everything is wrong with it. There are literally no redeeming qualities. But Magnum's gate. This is really something special. You have the experience walking from the hotel breakers along the beach. You have the spectacle seeing Magnum XL 200 run right beside you all the way out of the park. And then you have the functionality because this literally drops you off right in the mosh pit of Magnum, Corkscrew, Gemini, and Dragster's entrances. And you're only a very short walk from Frontier Town with the two best rides in the park. This entrance is the best by far, but it's kind of difficult to get to. If you want to use this entrance, you got to stay at a hotel or you got to be some sort of pass holder. I don't know exactly which one, but considering you're watching a review of the park, I'm assuming you're from out of town, so let's just stay, stay at Hotel Breakers. You can also stay at Lighthouse Point, but I'm going to be talking about Hotel Breakers later, and I would really recommend just staying at Hotel Breakers, but more on that when we get to the segment later in the video. But right now, we need to talk about... This is clearly the main event. This park has other rides besides coasters, but coasters are really the driving force here. If you don't like roller coasters, then I'm sorry, but you may want to reconsider why you're watching a channel named Coast Tunes. You also probably don't want to go to this park because there are 17 different roller coasters. What's crazy about this park is that the supporting coasters would easily be highlights for any other park out there, but here you kind of just brush over them. Val Raven, for example, was a ride I only got one ride on and never thought about again, and that's because the big four at this park are so good that they squash any other coaster. But at any other park in the US, Valraven would probably be the most popular ride in the standout. Like I said, the top four at this park are just a whole nother breed. You have Millennium Force, the world's first giga coaster that takes you on a journey secluded from the rest of the park while you ride on the edge of Lake Erie with, of course, an iconic station music.
you have Dragster, which is practically an outdoor show with the bleachers, lights, and sound effects so that watching the ride gets your heart racing. And of course, the launching at 120 miles per hour with the lap bar is unmatched. Then there's Maverick, which is one of the most aggressive rides I've ever been on. Even though it's trumped in height by basically every other coaster in the park, it packs quite possibly the most intense coaster experience I've experienced besides maybe Skyrush. It has one of the strongest moments of airtime in the park, what would be the best launch in the park if Dragster didn't exist, and the most violent elements on any coaster with the Stangle Dives. Maverick proves that size doesn't matter, it's how you use it. And then there's Steel Vengeance, which is my number one coaster and the greatest coaster ever built. I don't know what to say about Steve that hasn't already been said, so you know what? I won't. I'm going to be pulling airtime thrills to talk about Steve. Airtime is quite literally in his name, so the coaster with the most airtime in him are a perfect match. Go figure, I guess. Anyways, Mr. Thrills, take it away. Steel Vengeance is a perfect coaster. There is not a single dead spot on the ride, and that's impressive considering it seems to last forever. I don't know how RMC managed to take that hunk of junk in the back of the park and turn it into the most poppin' area of the park, but they did. This ride is an out-of-body experience and an out-of-seat experience. It starts when you have to cross the train tracks to get to its massive entrance plaza. This really makes the ride feel secluded from the rest of the park in the best way possible. The queue isn't really anything special, but the loud lift hill and the ride surrounding you in a circle really hypes you up to get on it. But who cares about that? We're here to talk about the ride. The first drop is textbook Cedar Point, in the best way possible. You know how people say that dive coaster drops are incredible and the best part of their rides? Well, on Steel Vengeance, you basically have a dive coaster drop to start out. 90 degrees, 200 feet straight down. But the crazy thing is, the drop is immediately outshined by both the top hat and the outer bank. And those give some of the craziest combinations of airtime and laterals out there. The inversions are also buttery. And there are moments on the ride that genuinely feel like they're trying to kill you. Diving in and out of the structure, being flung upside down with all the wooden supports around you. This might be the most discombobulating experience you'll ever have on a coaster. Well, except for maybe X2. This ride is relentless and perfect. And really, what more can I say about Steel Vengeance that I haven't already said? If you're genuinely this curious, then just go out to Cedar Point and experience it for yourself. Trust me. This alone makes the trip worth it. I do want to point out this top hat though. I feel like no one ever talks about it because they just rush right to the outer bank. The top hat is honestly the best element on the ride for me. The airtime on it is so strong and violent. The first half is literally like one of El Toro's camelbacks. It is that strong. <laughs> The second half has a super sharp jolt to the right that you can't really see in the POV, but when you ride it, you can definitely feel it. The thing is, this jolt takes place so high off the ground and you're still out of your seat because of the strong airtime that these laterals genuinely feel dangerous and is the only part of the ride that I'm actually still scared of and that's why I love it. But Steve isn't the only show in Frontier Town. Oh no, we also have the little intimate blitz that packs a punch of its own, Maverick. This was my second favorite coaster in the park and I got five rides in it as opposed to the seven on Steve, but in those five rides was the highlight of the trip. I got a Maverick night ride in the back row that gave some of the strongest airtime, the snappiest transitions, and the most out of control feeling I've ever felt on a coaster. For real, launching in complete pitch black darkness and bursting out with all that speed into the night is truly something special. But again, I have another guest to talk about it, so take it away, Parks. Bros. Intamin really outdid themselves with the incredible blitz coaster at the back of the park, Maverick. After years of going for taller, faster, and longer rides, Cedar Point decided to take a step back and focus on building something that was just as innovative, yet in a unique way. Maverick might have been the first blitz coaster, but it was so much more than just that. It was the first ride that used tighter and more compact elements as opposed to elements being long and drawn out. And that's a concept that is bled into most of the coasters that we see built today. But aside from its legacy, is the ride any good? The answer is a solid yes. Let me tell you guys, Maverick still holds up as one of the craziest experiences in the park, if not the country. The first drop doesn't look like much, but it'll surprise you every time. And the following twists are some of the most intense moments on any ride in the park. The airtime hill is about as powerful as it gets and the launch is pure bliss, especially at night when it's pitch black in the tunnel. Of course, we can't forget about those stangle dives at the end because they make the transitions at the beginning look like a cakewalk. They are the perfect way to cap off an already ludicrous ride. Maverick is really some of Intamin's finest work and is a strong highlight of the park. The restraints aren't for everyone, but if you can get past them, then this ride is sure to climb high in your rankings. But Maverick isn't Intamin's only venture in the park. Oh no, far from it. 
actually really far from it. That was probably the stupidest line in the script. Intamin also built Millennium Force, the world's first Giga Coaster, and I got El Toro Ryan to talk about it. You can never go wrong with the ride on Millennium Force. Millennium Force opened over 20 years ago, but still remains one of Cedar Point's premier attractions to this day, and that's for good reason. The ride takes you on a quest around that corner of the park, and it really is just magnificent. Many have called this ride Millennium Forceless, but I would have to disagree. This ride pulls some great forces at the bottom of its first drop, and at seemingly random points throughout the layout. The airtime hills are all very fun, and that speed hill at the end can give a quick pop of ejector, but that's not really what this ride is about. This ride is more about the overall experience. A good example of this is the lift hill, it's amazing. The view from almost any point on it is breathtaking, with Lake Erie on your left and all of Cedar Point on your right. It's by far the best view you can get on a coaster, as Dragster's view is a whopping 2 seconds if you're lucky. Your sense of speed is also unmatched on this ride. In the front row, you really do feel like you're flying at 100 miles per hour. Everyone should get a front row ride on Millennium Force because it's an experience unlike any other. This ride is also a marvel in block zones. For those of you that are unfamiliar, a block zone is a- Alright, that's enough. For anyone calling this ride boring, I get where you're coming from, but this ride isn't trying to be an airtime monster. For real, forget about your restraint and put your hands up on those floater hills. That was the first time I genuinely felt like I was flying on a roller coaster and there was something just so beautiful about that. This ride kind of reminds me of a modernized steel version of the beast where it's not trying to overdo forces but more to take you on a journey. It also gives a killer night ride just like the beast. This was my first coaster on the trip and it was certainly a worthy one. Pause. So I was going to do another segment on Dragster, but to be honest, I couldn't get another feature to cover it. So I'm just going to quickly talk about it here. I was going to have okay coasters, but he was pretty busy. So I guess you guys are stuck with me again. Sorry. But Dragster is a great ride. I'm not even going to do the launch disservice by trying to explain it. Just know that it's the best launch I've experienced. Going up that top hat is amazing. And the split second you have up there is really just spectacular. I would say you can see everything in the park around you, but you really don't have time because you're already spiraling down before you know it. The downward spiral feels especially aggressive with the lap bars and cruising back into the brakes past all those guests in lines is just something else. Some of the best guest interaction on any coaster in the park besides Millie, obviously. And yeah, the ride is short. In fact, in the duration I've been talking, you would have ridden this coaster three times, but honestly, what it packs in its 17 seconds is more powerful than most roller coasters out there. All right, I'm going to quickly go over every single other coaster in the park that I rode. This is my ranking of the rides I went on, and I didn't go on all of them because I didn't feel like wasting my time on credits when the world's best coasters in this park, and I'm realistically never going to get back here. The only major ones I didn't do were Wicked Twister because it was down the first day and when we tried again in the second day there was an hour and a half wait. Rougarou because I've been on a mirrored version of it at Great Adventure and a floorless coaster without a zero G roll is really just not worth it to me. And finally Gemini because it was either down when we walked by it or it had a super long wait. I'm not waiting over 30 minutes for an almost 50 year old ride when I can literally see Steel Vengeance from the same midway. Plus we weren't really by that section of the park that much because I wasn't as high in Magnum as everyone else is so we really only passed by that area if we were going from Dragster to Steve, which I believe was only once. Either that or we were on our way in or out of the park, which both times I'm certainly not going on Gemini. Like, no way I'm wasting our last ride of the night on freaking Gemini, and it's not even open in the mornings. Okay, so for the coasters I did go on, here's my ranking. Steel Vengeance. Perfect. Maverick. I love launch coasters and this is them at their finest. Dragster. Big car go vroom vroom. Millie. Felt like I was flying. Gatekeeper. This first drop genuinely still scares me. Plus, the keyholes are great and this is actually just a massive ride. Like, you don't realize how big it is until you get on it, and you're like, god damn, what did I get myself into? Valraven. The drop is just so fun, guys. And the airtime hill is fun, and the zero-g roll is fun, and like, come on, this ride is just fun. Give it a break. Magnum. Like I said before, I'm not as high in Magnum as some people, but I still do enjoy it. The couple airtime hills in the beginning give a bit of floater, and it's cool taking this trip outside the park and around the water park. And you can't forget that ASMR-like classic arrow lift sound music to my ears. The turnaround is a bit rough, but still manageable, and the finale of the ride is, well, it's Magnum's finale. Here's the thing, if you like raw airtime and just raw airtime with no banking or smoothness or really any rhyme or reason to it, 
this ride is your ride. These final airtime hills are so strong and perfect for that type of person. But for me, if I want airtime, I don't want the hill to be freaking triangular. Like, why would I want that? This airtime is sharp. That's the best way to describe it. I would rather airtime be smooth or strong, but not sharp. Sharp sounds like it's a mistake, but it's not. It's by design, not fun airtime. Again, if you like that raw stuff, then this is your jam. But trust me, it's not as fun as it sounds. I thought going into it, I would love Magnum for those final hills. And those hills definitely lived up to the hype, but they almost lived up to it a little too much to the point that I really just didn't love Magnum because of those hills. But Magnum's not a bad ride. If I were in the mood for some sloppy sharp ejector, I'd probably love Magnum, but I just rather ride Steve for proper airtime. Raptor. I still think Great Bear is better. Good ride, but it's overshadowed by the rest of this park, and I really just can't think of any standout moments. Blue Streak. It felt like it was going to fall apart. This is the ride that I rode and told myself I'm done with that credit nonsense because we waited 40 minutes for this. And uh, yeah, those are the coasters we went on. Overall, it's a fantastic collection, even with only like half the coasters being ridden, and definitely the best collection of coasters at any park. Look, if you love roller coasters, even if you just marginally like roller coasters, then this park is Candyland. Everywhere you look, there is a roller coaster. I'm convinced there's not a single spot in this park where you can stand and do a 360 and you can't see a single roller coaster in sight. I mean, just look at this shot. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight coasters in this one drone shot that's focusing on Dragster. That is absurd. This park is called the roller coaster capital of the world for a reason, and it's the main reason people come here. But there are other rides in the park. Obviously, they aren't as important as the coasters, but they still do exist, so let's talk about those. The only major flat ride I went on was Windseeker. This is basically a massive swing ride. You know I said Millie gives the best views of Cedar Point? Yeah, well, I kind of lied. It gives the best views from a coaster, but Windseeker gives the best views in the park. It practically is the same height as Millennium Force. It might even be taller, but it just gives you so much more time to take it in. You're also basically on the beach, so you can look out to the water too if you want. I also rode the antique cards with my friends, and we did it more as a meme than anything. I mean, I guess it was fine, but two teenagers aren't exactly its target demographic. As for the rides we didn't ride, there are a lot of really cool looking stuff. Max Air is a massive pendulum ride, Power Tower is also a massive drop tower, and then there's Skyhawk, which is an SNS scream swing, and you guessed it, it's massive. If you want some tamer rides, there's Giant Wheel. No, like it's actually called Giant Wheel. I'm not even just saying it's massive anymore. That's the actual name. There's also a glass blowing studio, which sounds really fun, and Pipe Scream. There's a ton of random flats scattered throughout the park that I'm not going to go too in depth in, but they're your standard flat rides carousels, Matterhorns, pirate ships, you name it. But now I want to talk about probably my favorite thing about this park the nightlife. Woo! <laughs> This park is actually popping at night. All the coasters are lit up, and being surrounded by a pitch black lake just gives this park an energy unlike any other. Lines at night were hype. People started multiple chants in line for Maverick. Everyone would be cheering on the way back into the station for Millie. And someone actually brought a speaker into Steel Vengeance's line and then just put in the lockers before getting on the ride. The energy was at an all time high, and with alcohol likely in a lot of people's systems, yes, this park sells alcohol in it, so that you too can be drunk on a roller coaster. People were extra talkative, extra energetic, and everything was just buzzed and poppin'. Stay for the night. Obviously, the night rides are fantastic, but also stay for the energy. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. If you want to ride all the coasters in this park, wait, let me rephrase that. If you want to ride most of the coasters in this park, okay, wait, one more time. If you want to ride half the coasters in this park, you're going to need a fast lane. This park gets slammed every single day. If you're only going to this park for one day, then may Lord have mercy on your soul and get a fast lane, because realistically, without one, you probably won't even get through the big four. Now, I'd say the perfect trip to Cedar Point is two, maybe three days with fast lane on at least one of them. This means that you'll have ample time to get on everything you want to get on and get multiple rerides on the rides you want to go on again. I did this two day plan with fast lane plus on the first day and it worked like a charm. Another word of advice is just cough up the extra like $50 to upgrade from fast lane to fast lane plus. The regular fast lane doesn't cover the big four, so it's essentially useless because those lines usually going to eat up most of your time. Steven Maverick usually gets a two. Dragster also breaks down a lot, so that ride is like a puzzle to get on. The line is always going to be long, and chances are the ride will break down on you while you're in it, so you really just want to get on it as fast as possible when you see it running. When I was there, Dragster broke down three times when we were in line once when we were at the freaking air gates. So yeah, these four are going to eat up a lot of your time. Millie's the only one that seems to be all right. It doesn't really break down, and it doesn't have two hour waits, but you know, a 90 minute average is still quite a bit. So just get that fast lane plus. You'll still have to wait for a couple of rides, most namely, yes, those big four, but it'll never be more than 15 minutes at most, and everything else you'll just walk right on. The second day we didn't have fast lane, we waited two hours for Raptor, an hour and a half for Maverick, an hour and a half for Gatekeeper, two hours for Steel Vengeance, and that's not to mention drags are breaking down 
on this and half hour through the line. Then we left the line and then 10 minutes later we saw it running again. So we got back in and waited another hour. So just get the fast lane plus no matter what. If you're going to Cedar Point for the first time, you need to stay at Hotel Breakers. It's a bit pricey, but it really makes your trip a hundred times better. Just try and plan it into the budget. Hotel Breakers is built feet away from some of the rides with a full-on beach, multiple dining options, three pools, and included early entry in the park that you can see from your hotel window. I'm being honest, I probably had equal fun at 2 a.m. with my friends roaming the hotel than when we were actually in the park. Obviously, it depends on who you go with, and we're a bunch of stupid teenagers, but you have access to the beach at all times. The hotel is absolutely absolutely massive for you to get lost in, which trust me, we did. And you gotta love stepping outside and seeing some of the world's best roller coasters. There's also Domino's delivery built into the hotel that my friend and I abused ordering three pizzas that were quickly thrown up. We walked over to the Magnum Gate at 1 a.m. We went to the beach water at I don't even know what time and we shook three different vending machines to get snacks. I probably shouldn't say that on the internet. That could count as theft. Anyways, you also have the added flexibility of going back to your hotel room at any point. Both days, we went back to the hotel room for an hour in the middle of the day to recharge. And all you need to do is ask the people before you leave the park at the gate for a re-entry ticket and voila. Just like that, you're free to come and go as you please. It's a five minute walk from your hotel to the Magnum Gate. Trust me, it gave me the opportunity to take a much needed shower after a painfully unshaded top throw dragster line. Just stay at Hotel Breakers. Don't bother with that lighthouse point nonsense or express stuff. Just stay at Breakers. Again. I know it's pricey, but if you're going to Cedar Point, you gotta ball out or go home. And this hotel is really the only way to do it. All right, so I know someone's gonna ask why there's no food section, and it's because we really didn't eat like a lot of the park. I guess I'll go through what we did eat because obviously some people are gonna say in the comments, this isn't an ultimate review because you didn't cover the food and the food is so important. So let's talk about the food real quick. When we went to the park the first night, we got a pizza from Domino's at Hotel Breakers. Hotel Breakers had delivery for everyone in the hotel for Domino's and a couple other places but we just got a pizza and cheesy garlic bread. It was pretty good. Then the first day at the park for breakfast, we got some chicken tenders because we were doing early rides and we didn't really feel like getting a sit down actual breakfast. We wanted to get a Cinnabon, but it was closed during early entry. So we got some chicken tenders from the coasters and drive place. I don't know, whatever it's called. After that, we didn't eat again until the night where we ordered yet again, another pizza. This time it was thrown up in the shower. Then the next morning we had a delicious breakfast of Froyo right by Wicked Twister. Delicious and nutritious. And then we didn't eat again until, you guessed it, the pizza at night. Well, actually, we did eat M&Ms in Maverick's line, but that was pretty much it. And at night, I said, Jaden, we're not getting another pizza. So he's like, all right, all right, I'll get a cheese pizza and I'll just add a couple things. He literally just made a freaking pizza out of the cheese pizza customized order. It, it, he just added bacon, ham, and pepperoni. Like, it's basically a pizza. So yeah, that's why I'm not going to really talk about food in this review besides this little segment, if you want to call this a food section. But again, we didn't really eat that much besides a bunch of freaking pizzas. All right, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Cedar Point is the best park I've been to, and trust me, I've been to quite a few. It has my number one and two coasters, is the birthplace of some of my best memories with my friend, and has the most cinematic and best entry experience out of any park I've been to. Honestly, a lot of other parks to me just look boring now. This lineup really eats alive any competition, and the Elite's rides at the top are some of my favorites. No, not some. They are my favorites. If you're looking for a quick getaway for three or four days, this is the place. If you like roller coasters and theme parks at all, this is the place. If you're a thrill seeker chasing your next big thrill this is the place cedar point is really just something else it was the only park i genuinely felt sad leaving i was only there for not even three whole days i would recommend a visit here to practically anyone watching this video so i'm going to give cedar point the roller coaster capital of the world also known as america's roller coast a 10 out of 10 easily and i would go higher if i could Real quick, big thanks to Airtime Thrills, Parks Bros, and El Toro Ryan for collabing with me for this video. Airtime Thrills did the segment on Steel Vengeance, and he makes some of the most entertaining and addicting coaster content in the community. He was the one that got me into coasters. Parks Bros did Maverick segment, and while he's a new channel that I started watching, I can't get enough of his super in-depth coaster reviews. And finally, you all know who El Toro Ryan is. He's a legend in the community, and his coaster vlogs are some of the most chaotic yet amazing coaster content out there, and of course his problematic coaster as well. You've already seen them. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.